we're going to talk about using open source software to collect performance metrics. I know that's a really long title. It's just short for getting metrics. Um, I'm Tracy Bajiano. I'm a senior database administrator with DocuSign here in Seattle, but I live in North Carolina. You've probably already done this because you've been to multiple sessions today, but please silence your cell phones. And if you need to take any calls, just you know, answer it and run out the door. Um, you've seen this a few times this week as well, so anybody got questions about any of the resources that PASS has? There's a lot of them. No, okay. Like I said, I'm Tracy Bajian with DocuSign. You can hit me up on LinkedIn. There's my Twitter handle. The easiest way to find me is to go to databasesuperhero.com. That's my uh, main website. I have over 20 years of experience with SQL Server. Um, I know I really don't look old enough for that, but I, I do. I just recently wrote a book on Query Store with uh, Grant Fritchie. Um, I'm a SQL Saturday addict. I do about 20 a year, which seems insane. Um, I'm also a guardian ad litem for the last 16 years. I advocate for foster kids in court for their best interest. I've advocated for over 50 kids in that 16 year span. That's my favorite and most important job. I, you know, database jobs just pay for that. So this is a sample of a dashboard that you will see later on in a more interactive mode where you're getting some stats on your SQL server. And this is just mainly showing you the uh, server properties up at the top as far as your databases and how long the server's been up and memory and how many C CPUs you have and what's been happening on your CPU over the course of time. But there's a whole bunch more metrics you, you will see because I can't fit them all on one screen, but this is just to give you a taste of what you're going to see later. This is our agenda that we're going to go over. We're going to go over the topology so you know how this is all set up and how to run it in your environment. Then we're going to go over what InfluxDB is because that's where you're going to store your data that you're collecting from SQL Server and from other sources if you choose to use this to monitor other things. We're going to go over what Telegraph is because that's what you're actually using to collect the data and we're going to go through the queries that Telegraph is running against your SQL Server instance so you know what it's actually doing. Then we're going to go over Grafana, which is what you just seen on that screen that actually displays the data to you. Then we're going to go over a couple of resources that you can use to actually collect queries because none of those things actually collect the queries for you so you can see that actually what's running behind the scenes. So you need a couple extra resources to do that. And one's built into SQL Server, one's not, so it depends on what addition of SQL Server on what you want to implement. And then we might stand up a container if we have time. We might not. We'll see. So as far as the topology goes, we have Telegraph, Influx, and Grafana. So you start off with a you got start off with SQL servers with it on premise. You would start off with SQL servers with Telegraph installed as a service. Then you would have a monitoring server or two, depending on whether you want to split them out. And you would have InfluxDB on one and Grafana on another one, or you can put them on the same server. Then you would pump the data in from the servers into InfluxDB and then Grafana displays the data for you. And then you got a nice pretty web browser that you go to and see the data. Then it also will actually store data from managed instances in Azure SQL DB. So in that instance, you can't install Telegraph on a managed instance or Azure SQL DB because it's up in the cloud and you don't have access to us you know, that environment is not an actual virtual server or any place where you can install a service on that instance. So you would have to install the Telegraph instance on your monitoring server and point it to your Azure DB by putting in the parameters in the config file. And you basically have the same setup from that point forward. And this is Microsoft's example of what a managed instances looks like. They pumped in two managed instances into Telegraph pump the data influx and Grafana, and then you had a browser. So basically the same topology we've just seen in the previous slide. But like I said, you can do Azure SQL DB as well using the same topology. So as far as influx DB goes, why, why are we using it and what is it? So it's a time series database. So it basically captures data very well for timestamp data and queries it efficiently. They're also the ones behind the project for Telegraph. So that's one reason it's, it's built for Telegraph, really. Um, 
Telegraph can go into other databases. If you choose to use something else, you can. It will actually put data in SQL Server if you want it to. It just won't query it as well. <laughs> just depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, so it can capture data at regular or irregular times. They're using this for IoT stuff. Sensor data is more commonly used for monitoring. It's designed to capture data that's coming in really fast. Um, we, we are monitoring getting things at every 10 seconds off the SQL servers, all ingesting a whole bunch of data, 500 servers, throwing in data for all our metrics. And it keeps things at a high precision for short periods of times, but it also lets you downsample the data. If you're collecting at 10 second intervals and you get three months out, you probably don't need a 10 second intervals for like the first month anymore. And you can downsample it where it gives you a rolling average for like five minutes for that first month of data. And then you don't have to keep that detailed data and you can conserve on space. And it just would automatically do that behind the scenes without you having to do anything but set up a one-time command. So as far as installing InfluxDB, you want to pick your operating system you want to put it on. I choose Linux. It's free. Hence my open source. <laughs> but um, you can run it on Windows. If you run it on Windows, you have to use the non-sucking service manager to get it to set up as a service. I think that's the right acronym for that one. Then you can use the commands on their website for whichever. <laughs> it's true. I see you laughing. So you use the commands on the website for whatever version of the oper operating system that you chose to, chose to use for your server to download it, because there's different versions of Linux. There's different ways to download it. There's different ways to install it. Um, you're going to have to open up the port on the firewall, because by default, Linux is locked down on ports. It's not Windows and wide open. And you have to tell it to actually start the service. It's not like when you install SQL or Exchange or any other thing on Windows and the service is automatically started for you. And you have to tell it to actually auto start. That way when you reboot the server, it's actually started. It's not like SQL and everything else where it's all, that stuff's already configured for you. So Linux is a little different. So then after you get that part done, you need some databases to hold your data. You'll want to set up a retention policy so that it actually purges out your data. I, by default, set up one for a year. I figure after a year, I'm not going to need my monitoring data. I hope not. If somebody wants to know what happened <laughs> that far back, oh, well. <laughs> or we're going to downsample it and do, do some sort of purging that way. And you can optionally set up some downsampling of the data. Some concepts for time series databases, they're named differently than tables and columns and things like that. They have what you call measurements. Measurements are more what you think of as when you do tables. So they have things called field keys in there, and those are your string columns. Then they have tag keys, which contain your integer values or your float values that tell you what your metrics were that you actually collected, the numbers that came in. Then you have the the retention policy that I just mentioned. So you can set it up for 365 days, uh, one month, whatever you need to do. Then we have the downsample data. So the downsample data will actually go into a separate database. And you can tell it to roll it up. Like I said, the five minute increments can take that 10 second data and do an average, a mean, any statistical number thing that you want to do. You can do it that way. You can do a max a min and do different things that way. And then a series will, will share your retention policies and your measurements all together. So you only have to define it once and you don't have to worry about defining it across different things. So it makes it very simple. Once you set it up, it, it goes across everything in that database and it's set up. And you don't have to do it for each measurement or anything like that. So. These are all the measurements that Telegraph gives you just for SQL Server by itself. And we're going to go over what queries are going to populate these. So this is just to give you a list. And there's a couple that are just for Azure SQL DB and one just for managed instances. So we're going to go in and query a little bit on InfluxDB just so you can see some of the stuff that it has. There 
never type in demos, right? Yep, never type in demos. So I just opened up Influx, which I thought I already had. And I can't spell anything. I gotta open the database first. Then we can show measurements. Now I have a lot more measurements than the ones we've seen on that particular screen because I'm capturing some Windows statistics off of my machine, some stuff off my Linux machine. And up at the top, I have stuff off my InfluxDB database as well. But those are all the different tables, basically, that it's collecting data from. Now, that spit out a lot of data that you can't see, but for each one of the measurements, it's telling me what measurement, uh, what metric it's actually collecting. So for wind system, it's getting the context switches per second, the, pro the processor queue length, the system calls per second, and the system uptime. But as you can see, we're collecting a lot of data per each measurement that we had. So each one of those things you can actually graph on in Grafana. And these will all make more sense once we get into Grafana and see some of the actual queries. But I wanted to show you how you can query it in Influx and see, see some of the more detailed things. Now we can just show that I'm a horrible typer. Horrible typer. So this is showing you what the string object is in each one of the measurements. So we can tell by when system that it's showing the host and the object name. So that way you know which server it's going to and which object you're picking up. Or which instance you are. If you're on a SQL server, you might have a named instance versus a server name. So those type of things are important when you're trying to pull up the data. And when you do a show series, it, it's showing you every series of type of data uniquely that it's actually qualifying and getting. So in Win Systems, I've got two different hosts that it's pulling data from and two different objects it's pulling data from on the system. For Win Swap, I'm doing the same thing for one host and an instance total and a page 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 filing. So you've got lots of different metrics that it's pulling from. That's all we got for that. Back to whatever this is because it's not PowerPoint. Yes. No problem. Um, for what you're seeing for InfluxDB, there is, there is another tool that you can use for it that I don't remember the name of off the top of my head that you can use to query the data and, and set up things. Um, I just don't remember the name off the top of my head. There's actually a few of them. If you, if you Google it, you can find one for sure. I'm just so used to using the command line for showing it that <laughs> that's what I did. So. Jeff might remember the name of it. He's shaking his head yes, but. Yeah, you're, you're pretty much going to be looking at Grafana. So, and it's going to drop down the fields for you, and you're going to be picking the table names, the measurements, and everything from there, and not really going into Influx. Influx, I just wanted to show the concepts to you so you could kind of see them. Yes, next question. So the question is, Influx do the roll-up and the aggregation. So Grafana is going to send a query over to Influx, just like you, any other application sends one over to SQL Server. So it's going to run on the database and do, do the aggregation against the database and send the data back to Grafana. Yes? Yes, there's, there's a way to tell it 
which things to collect on SQL Server. You can tell it which ones to exclude and which ones to, to include. And by default, it includes everything, and you can tell it which ones not to do based on the config file. There's a config file that you, you tell it what your host name is, what the username and password is to connect to your SQL Server, and then you can tell it which things it exclude. And we're going to go over the config file here in a little bit. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to be showing that in a little bit as well, the long, long, long list once we get to Telegraph. <laughs> like right now. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, for spoiling it. You're called out on camera now. So, Telegraph is an open source project that's on GitHub that's written in Go, so you guys can contribute to it if you choose to, and you can look at all the code. So you can know exactly what it's doing against your system, which is great. I, that's my favorite part. So it has a lot of inputs and outputs. Like I was saying before, the main output for it is InfluxDB, but you do have other options as far as places you can store the data, like Elasticsearch. I was in Denmark presenting this last year, and somebody was telling me how great it was on Elasticsearch, and I was like, cool. I never heard anybody that was using an Elasticsearch. So if it, if it works for you there, use it there if that's something you already have in your infrastructure. You can give it a go there and see how well it works for you. Um, you can also output the data to SQL Server. I found that not to be so great. I've tried it. <laughs> so, huh? It just doesn't query as fast as a time series database does. That's why I, uh, we, we don't do SQL Server. It, it, it doesn't automatically put the indexing in place for you. So you have to go through and do a lot more configuration around it, whereas when it's a time series database, everything's time stamped and it's already got the indexing built in behind the scenes without you even having to do anything to make the queries go fast. So it's a lot less configuration on your part. So as I was mentioning, too, there's a lot of inputs where you can collect data from. We can collect data from SQL Server, Linux, Windows, Postgres, MySQL, there's a zillion other things you can collect from. There's literally a lot of applications you can collect things from. One thing that's missing is Oracle. I don't know why. It's not because Microsoft wrote it or anything like that. InfluxDB wrote this, so. But Oracle is missing, but they do have another databases. They have Docker out there. They have Kubernetes already programmed into it, so. There's a lot of dashboards that already exist on the Grafana website that you can download and you can just plug in once you've got it set up to monitor the data. So, so to install Telegraph on, on Windows, you can download the latest stable version from the Influx actual website because, like I said, they're the ones that are in charge of the project and started it. Then on Windows, what I do is I just create a folder in my program files and I, I um, unzip it there and then I edit my config file to tell it what I want to monitor for SQL Server. So you have to uncomment out the parts that are for SQL Server and the parts that are telling it to store it in InfluxDB. And then I create it as a service using PowerShell. And then I'm done. It's ready to go. And it's pumping data in InfluxDB because my InfluxDB is already set up. Yes, question over here? Tele Telegraph is a, the service you install on, on SQL Server or on a machine that you want to monitor SQL Server. Yes, and it puts data into InfluxDB. That, that runs the project for Telegraph. So this is the PowerShell script I use that, that will, it'll go out and install it on multiple servers for you. Of course, I recommend you don't just throw it on all your servers at once. So put it on one test server the first time around. <laughs> and it'll actually copy it into your program files from you from a network share that, that you specify in here once you edit it. You set up your config file and tell it just go to local host for your on-prem SQL servers. And it'll connect locally to your, your SQL server. And you have your config file sitting there, and it should, you're basically, you want to collect the same metrics everywhere, so you configure it the same way. And it'll set it up as a service and go ahead and start the service for you, and then you've got your data pumping in influx without having to go to each individual server and set it up. So, it's very simple to get going. Yes, question over here? Yeah. 
Uh, I, I'm going to show you the config file here in a little bit. Actually, it might. It's coming up in a couple slides. So, as far as installing on Linux, it's a little bit different installing on Linux. That's one reason I actually looked into this project was because SQL went on Linux, and I did not like that Microsoft had did an article about collecting it with CollectD and putting it in FluxDB and doing Grafana, and we had a different way to monitor everything for Windows. It was like, why can't we do everything the same way? And then we found a way to do it the same way, and then Microsoft actually coded everything for Azure to go into Telegraph after that, after we showed them this. So it all worked out to be great. But for Linux, you got to do it slightly different. You download it from the InfluxDB website using their commands. You got to use their command to create the config file, then edit it with uh, one of your favorite editors for Linux, Vi or Nano. I know a lot of people aren't really using Linux, so everybody's probably wanting me to skip this slide. <laughs> <laughs> but one day you will be. You got to start the service like I was mentioning before for InfluxDB, and you got to tell it to auto start, just like we did before, like we do with any service on Linux, evidently, from what I've done. Now onto the config file, like I said, we would get to. So the first part of the config file that we need to edit is for outputs to tell it to go to InfluxDB. So we're going to give it a URL first. So the first part's the HTTP part. I'm just doing IP addresses locally on my machine, but you can give it a DNS name to go to. And your port that you have for InfluxDB is 8086. That can be changed in its config file if you don't want to use that port. And then you tell it what database to go to. I always just name database Telegraph because it's got Telegraph data in it. You can name it differently. For your config file, you go down to the inputs, and like I said, it has a zillion inputs when it creates a config file, so you have to scroll forever. So do control F and go find it, because you know if you do page down, you'll be finding it forever. But I just go localhost, I give it a fancy password, a telegraph123 on my demo machine, so y'all can hack my demo machine all you want. Important to put query version number two on there, because our company did a lot of work with changing it from query version 1 to query version 2 to make them more efficient. And then if you're doing Azure DB, you're going to want to change that Azure DB, uncomment it out, and make it true so you can collect the Azure DB stats. And then if you want to exclude any particular queries, this is where you would tell it to exclude. These are the two that right now I recommend excluding because they're new and I don't have any dashboards for them, so there's no point in me collecting them. And in the config file, they do have a list of all the things that you would have to type in to tell it which ones to, to exclude. It's just not enough room on the screen for me to show them all. So, yes. Yeah, it's getting performance counters from the DMVs and weight stats and things like that. We're getting ready to go over the queries. Yes. It's, it's, it's a subset of the performance counters from the DMVs. It's, and you, you do have a way to configure performance counters from Windows itself. So you can collect any Windows performance counter you want as well. There's no custom way to do that at the moment, but you can contribute to the uh, project on GitHub. Yeah, you can change it yourself and recompile it and use your own version of Telegraph, or you can contribute to the project itself and make it better for everybody else. No. So, like I was mentioning, we can add performance monitoring counters on there. So, I add processor counters to it. I tell it what measurement I want to store it in. So we're capturing our Windows CPU counters because that's the best way to get our CPU counters. We don't want to get them from SQL Server because we only get one counter. And we want to see our privilege time, our user time, and our processor time. And we get these counters and I tell it what measurement to put it in. And now we've got a Windows monitoring counter coming in. And you can do that for any Windows performance monitor counter there is. So you can collect network data, disk data, anything for any application. And then you can build a nice dashboard. For Linux, you do the same thing. You got inputs for CPU, you tell it it's true, total CPU, collect CPU is false, and report active is false. These are the defaults when you tell it to create the file on Linux. So, 
As far as creating your user inside a SQL Server, you just got to create a user with a nice strong password. Again, you can hack my SQL Server, depending on which password I'm actually using, because now I've shown you two. So you got to guess, 50-50 chance. So, and then you got to grant view server state to Telegraph. That's the only permission it needs. So I can create the DMVs. Huh? Yes, you can use a Windows account for it, yes. And then you would just grant it the same permissions. This is just what it defaults to as, a, as its documentation. In Azure SQL DB, you do the same thing, except you got to do view database state because it's a database and not a server. So. so now we'll go over some of the DMVs that it's collecting data from so you'll know what it's collecting and what you might want to turn off if you don't need that data. So first it's starting off and it's getting your memory clerk. So this is like your buffer pool and what plan cache is doing, your SQL reservations when memory grants go nuts and it takes 20 gigs of your memory for some reason and you don't know why. Seen a few spikes of those in my time. <laughs> yeah, at that company. <laughs> You get your virtual file I.O. stats so you can see how much data is being read and, read and written from your disk, how fast it's being read and written from your disk for per database and per file. So you can sum those up per database. You can see them per file and know if they need to be moved around on your disk. This usually isn't as much of a problem anymore because we got solid state drives and fusion I.O.s and things like that. But if you've still got an old system, an old disk, you may still need this data or you may just want to know how much data is being pumped through. And then you're getting the same data for Azure. So you can see how much data is happening on Azure and that might be actually more useful because then you might need to know that you need to adjust your DTUs and things like that out there and up your limits. Then we're getting our server properties on prem by looking at how much memory we're getting and we're getting all our server properties as far as what edition we're running, what engine we're running, how many CPUs we have, and basic information about how many databases we have, whether they're online, whether they're restoring, whether they're suspended, and basic information like that at the server level. Then we're getting basically the same information about the managed instance as well if we're collecting against a managed instance. And we get uptime as well from that queries. And we do the same thing for Azure SQL DB. So you, you've seen a theme here? <laughs> so these are pretty easy. So the OS schedulers is, is a pretty long query where it's telling you what each OS scheduler is actually doing on the system, whether it's idle and online and anything's running against it. Currently, I don't have a dashboard for this, though, because this is something new that Microsoft actually added to it while they were working on some Azure pieces. So that's something if you're going to use it, you probably should turn it off if you're just going to throw my dashboards out there because there's nothing consuming the data to show it to you. That's why it's recommended in my slide deck to have it off. So as far as performance counters go, we're actually collecting a subset of performance counters, and it's got all the math to turn the performance counters into the correct number because sometimes you got to, if it's equal to a certain number, you got to do certain calculations to make it the correct number and divide it by 100 and get percents and all that stuff based on the counter type it is. And then we're getting um, resource governor data based on your resource pools. So if you use resource pools and resource governor in enterprise edition, you can see some data based around that as well. Then we're getting wait stats for on-prem and managed instances, and those are basically the same. And we're using the Paul Randall's query and excluding the ones that can be ignored. And on our dashboards, we're actually rolling those up into the query store categories and then letting you drill down into those categories and seeing what is specific to that category. So you'll see categories like CPU and buffer and I.O., and then be able to drill down and see what specifically is going on with the CPU, buffer, and I.O., rather than just seeing a really long list of wait stats in the dashboard. And also notice that the wait time has to be over 100 milliseconds or it will not pull it over either. So it's, looking, it's not trying to capture every single wait stat. It wants, it wants it to be substantial before it captures it so it's not so heavy. And it does the same thing for your DB wait stats 
on Siegel Azure DB. And, it, and it's again using Glenn Allenberry and Paul Randall's scripts as far as what to exclude. And we get resource stats from Azure SQL DB as far as your DTU limits and how much percent of your memory you're actually using and how much CPU, CPU you're using. This data, I believe, is going in there every five minutes as a snapshot, and we're pulling it out so that you can see it and chart it and see if you're reaching your limits as to what capacity you're using and if you need to up it. We're looking at our resource governor on managed instances as well. The same thing there. Are you reaching your instance cap, your max log rate, and things like that, and you need more, more power from your managed instances because you're paying for the power that they're giving you, and you need a way to monitor it. This is a free way to monitor those things. Managed instances are expensive. More resource stats from SQL Azure DB. Same thing there. Are you at your max CPU? What is your max CPU? Do you need more DTUs? The SQL Server request this is another one I do not have a dashboard for, but it's actually going out there and collecting queries for you that are not being blocked. And that's basically it, the ones that are not being blocked because I highlighted that part at the top. But I don't have a dashboard for that one, so I recommend turning that one off. It's a little bit heavier of a query anyways to be running every 10 seconds. So... Those are all your measurements that were created in InfluxDB. So now we're going to look at Grafana because Grafana is going to be a little bit more interactive and less boring than the rest of the talk was. <laughs> Just being honest, you've seen a whole bunch of queries and you're like, how's all that apply? What's it look like? You're ready to look at some stuff now. So let's talk about configuring Grafana so that you can actually use it. So the first thing we're going to do is set up the data source to talk to InfluxDB. So, you, you know, you got to give it a name. You got to tell it you're using InfluxDB or Elasticsearch or SQL Server, whatever database type you decide to use. You fill out the URL, and then you fill in the details that tell it what database and username and password to use, the default password and username or admin. And you just save and test it, and it'll tell you whether it can connect or not. Then you just go and import the dashboards. The dashboards are out on GitHub. I've got the SQL Server dashboards on my GitHub. Microsoft has the Azure managed instances and the SQL Azure DB ones on their GitHub. I've got links to all that in the PowerPoint. PowerPoint's uploaded on the website, so they're all available for download. So you would just copy and paste the JSON in here. You can rename them if you don't like the names. Click load, and then you have everything you need. And because you've already did all the other stuff with Influx and set up your telegraph, you've already got data and you're ready to look at it. A couple of features in Grafana, though, that you want to be aware of before you go into Grafana so you have more stuff to play with is you've got annotations that you can do. You can actually click on the charts and mark something that's happened in time. Say you add an index to a particular instance and you want to see what effect it had on something. You can actually click in there and say, added XYZ index to server XYZ. And then a blue line will show up on your CPU or wherever chart you decide to add it on. Maybe you added it down where the buffer pool is, and you want to see if the buffer pool increases and, and gets better in performance. Then you, you have a marked line that tells you something happened on the server. Or you can set up something on your server that automatically sends a line in every time the server gets restarted, so you can see what happens when it gets restarted. Because there's ways to do that as well with PowerShell. You can also set up alerts. Say you want to get an alert every time the CPU gets above 50%, 90%. You can send those into Slack channels, PagerDuty. We use PagerDuty. That's the only reason I use that example. Email, number of other things. <laughs> Slack's my favorite one at this point, in this point in time. You have multiple data sources. So you can pull data out of SQL Server. You don't have to pull everything out of InfluxDB. Instead, if you decide you want to keep the inventory of your SQL servers in there, that way you can point back to them and have a chart of those just so that you have a list. I've seen somebody do this, just have an inventory of their databases and then made a chart where if they clicked on it, it went into my charts. So they had some basic information about what the purpose of their servers were, who owned them, and they had this extra data sitting in SQL Server and built a chart on top of it and then drilled down. So you can build more dashboards and do more things with it and pull data from different places. Then you got more plugins you can do. I don't currently use a table in any of my 
stuff. So like if you have SP who is active into a table, you can actually pull that data into a, a, a dashboard and match it up with the time frame that's on my dashboards and, and highlight and click things and then drill down into it and see what was actually running at that particular time that you ran SP who is active. So those are different things that you can do by adding plugins and things. So now we will look at some dashboards. Machines up. Demo failure. I dropped. Why you messed up? Hang on just a sec. This is my worst fear of happening right now. So I have no idea why this is happening. Because the machines is actually up. Okay. So this is the main dashboard for SQL Server. We'll just have a smaller screen for stuff. And at the top, it shows you the server properties. So the first part is the online databases, offline, restore, pending, recovery, suspended, how long the server's been up, how many cores and memory it has. Then we look at what the CPU is doing. If you want to, any particular metric that you want to see by itself, you can just click on it, and it disappears all the other metrics. You can control click and just see two metrics and shift click and see them all again. This is an annotation I put in this blue line. I pretended like I put an index in there. I really didn't. I just wanted to put an annotation in there, but you just click and add an annotation and put whatever description you want in there. You can add a tag. I tagged it with the name of my server, which happens to be AG1 and I hit cancel. But at the top, if I change this over to my Linux box, you'll notice that my metrics for my CPU change to the names that you would see on a Linux server. That's all you got to do to see the difference between a SQL on Linux box and a SQL on Windows box, is just point it to the right server. There's nothing else you got to do. It's the same dashboard. You go nowhere else. Question back there? Uh, the instance is at the top in the drop down box right here. I'm not sure. I couldn't figure that out. It should be showing up, but this box hasn't been up and running that long, so it may be just that it hasn't picked it up yet. Because it's only been up and running for 23 minutes. So, And I'm refreshing it only every five, so. Then we get to, was there another question? I thought I saw another hand, yes. Um, can you set it up so like on those green boxes on the top, if you have a database in the state you don't want it to be in, maybe you could hover it over to show what's, like if one of those zeros was a one, can you it, set it up it, so it, 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 it actually turns orange or red for you. It doesn't tell you what's going on, okay. but it will turn a different color. So. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't configure for the name of the databases, no. Yeah, you can actually set up a different dashboard and drill down and see the specific data, but you can't do hovering over and see data. But, and we'll see an example of a drill down when we get to wait stats so that you can understand sort of how that works.
I figured it was, but I can't find the other one, so. <laughs> oh, it's not. It's the right bar. Oh, there we go. There goes the bar. They're too close together. That's why it needs to work on the outside of the box, not inside the virtual box. But at any rate, I knew something would break. <laughs> well, this is activity on the server, and it's show, showing us our user connections, our transactions per second, batch requests, SQL recompiles, deadlocks, and things like that. Then we get into wait stats, and this is where we see the categories for uh, query store and where we can see our first drill down into another dashboard. And the icon up in the corner here tells us that it's going to drill down, that it has a drill down. And when you click on that, you can see preemptive is our top one in CPU. So when we go down in here, we're going to select preemptive and down in CPU. That way we can see the specific ones that were causing us problems. Not that they were really causing us problems for the 23 minutes we were up. But SSO schedule yield looks familiar, and then all these preemptive things that it was doing on the server were the ones that we need to troubleshoot if we were troubleshooting that particular issue at that particular time. One thing else you can do, which I'm going to do right now, and then we'll go through the rest of the metrics that are there, is you can click and drag, and it'll highlight and adjust the whole dashboard to that particular time frame so that you can drill down into the data and only see what you want to see for a specific time frame. So if you want to see something for, because you can see this activity right here is larger than the other activity, you can get it where you can only see that activity, and it tells you that time frame up at the top. And you can actually click on that time frame and adjust it as well. If you knew, know you want to go back to last week, you can just click on it and adjust it. You can actually pick, you know, last six hours, 12 hours, two days. I think it goes to last week, 90 days, six months, a year, five years. Ugh, five years. But at any rate, I got the wrong bar again. Huh? Um, at one job, I was collecting every 10 seconds. At the next job, I did 30 seconds, or next two jobs. Yeah, there's, in the configuration file, you can tell it how often to collect the data. There's a parameter at the very top that you can tell it how often to collect the data. Yes. Oh, it took me back to that. I don't want to be on that. Now we got the memory details. So if we wanted to know how much our buffer pool was suffering from, which is not a good example in this box because we haven't loaded any data, we could check our buffer pool and see how much data was loaded in the memory and see if anything was pushing data out of our buffer pool, such as a large store procedure or a memory grant happening. And memory grants have supposedly gotten better in 2019, right? So hopefully we could see that improvement by upgrading our servers. We've got our page life expectancy and anything that might affect that in this chart and, and affecting the buffer management. Then we got some stuff around TempDB usage. This will help you keep up with your version store if you're using read committed snapshot isolation. That little yellow line down at the bottom on that first one tells you your version store. And then we're keeping up with our read and write latency on our disk, which is horrible on my machine. It's averaging 29 milliseconds to, to read stuff. Mm. Then we keep up with our disk space, and this is another chart that I don't know why it's populating our data size, but it should be populating the size of our databases as well. But it didn't for that. And we've got AG stats, so we can actually watch everything go in for as far as the AGs are across the wire and see what it's doing, whether it's delayed and behind and how many bytes are, are being received and sent and stacked up. So you can see the, that data. Then we can watch our logs flush and how much they're waiting for things to be written to disk and put in your transaction log. And we've got more around your access methods. So you can see how many times you're reading your heap tables with your forwarded records. I personally added that one for one company. And you see how many times you're doing a full scan of an index and how many index searches you're doing. Those are 
pretty valuable things to do and watch your memory management. Then we got our, work, our resource governor stats. So if you're using work resource governor and you've got groups set up, you can actually see what CPU is being used by group, how many requests per seconds are going in by group, and block tasks by group. And we use this at one company to do this by application. So we had every application come in by name, and then we had a group for each name, and then we could see what every application was doing to our system. And then we could go and complain at them <laughs> and tell them to stop it. They're laughing because they know it's true. Yes? Do you have a rough idea of how much this space saved in a month's worth of memory? Not a month's worth, but I, can, I have a chart at the end that tells you how much we were using when I left, and we had about six months of space that I'll tell you about how much it cost us so running it in AWS that I'll get to. So a few other charts to look at. Did I get all the way to the top now? I hate not having a regular mouse. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> so we have database latency, so we can see our reads and writes for our database. Now I can't see this bar again. I hate this thing. Page down. There we go. We'll use that instead until the bar comes back. See, there's the bar. So we can do our read latency per database and, and how, see how many bytes were being read. I did this for a particular company as well because they had like terabytes of data and didn't know that they were reading it and writing it like terribly as they were. And like I said, we could drill down on this and see what in particular was being read and written at that particular time. We do have a database size. Um, instances at a glance lets you look at multiple servers at the same time. So if we had two AGs set up and we wanted to compare what was going on, at, on with them at the same time, we could look at their weight stats and see this one has preemptive CPU while this one's reporting. But they can't see it. Preemptive and replication are its problems. So. And one's at 100% CPU while the other one's 22. That doesn't sound very good. So. Now we have some other dashboards besides just the regular SQL Server ones. I can show you the managed instance ones because they will run against a regular SQL Server. My scrolling will work better for me. So this is what a managed instance will look like as far as batch requests and transactions per second if I do it longer than 15 minutes. And it's basically the same type dashboards, except they've got, it, got their resource governor stuff in here and resource stats that they need to see. And they got different weight, they do their weight types differently. And they got single wait time and wait type stats. So they they have their data aggregated differently, so you can see what you need to see for managed instances. I've also got dashboards in here for InfluxDB, because you might want to be monitoring the instance that's pulling down, your, holding your data for this. So it's showing us our CPU on our InfluxDB how much memory is being used, how much disk is being used, the system disk, how much active queries we have, how many measurements we've got in the database, how many series we're actually keeping up with. So we've got 757 metrics we're keeping up with. That's a lot. And we're not showing all those on all the charts. So. <laughs> yeah, you can actually, when you hit edit at the top, you can actually come in here. No, it doesn't keep up with the queries that are running. I don't have any charts for that. And I actually recommend you use Query Store or SPU as active to keep up with that data. So I actually go into that in another, another uh, slide, So, which I think we might be ready to go to that so we don't lose time. Or how long do I go to? 
I don't remember when I stopped, so. 4.30. Yeah, you can actually set up a Windows counter for, um, they, they have a plug-in for monitoring Windows services that you can, it will tell you whether the service is set up to, if it started, suspended, or stopped. So then you can use that and have a chart for that and then set up an alert if it happens to come in stopped or suspended. So that's just an extra thing that you have to set up. So. That's what I recommend because if you set it up in one spot and it goes down, then you're not collecting stats. Yeah. Yeah, te technically you can put it on one server and tell it each server to go to. You can do that. And that's kind of what you do with Azure because you set it up on one server and you've got, if you've got Azure SQL DB, you may have 20 databases sitting up in Azure. So you tell it every 20 databases to go to. You have 20 users out there that connect to each one of those Azure DBs. So you've got 20 different connections to find in the config file. So that's what you're doing there. And you could do that with your on-premise servers if you wanted, or the ones that are VMs in the cloud, or however, wherever you've got your on-prem stuff sitting. Question here? Yeah, so, yeah, sending it out. And you've only got view data server status anyway, so you can't, you can't see any customer data. You can't even see what, it, it does have the ability to pull out queries, like what's running, and, but that's, I recommend you keep that turned off because I think that's too heavy to run every 10, 30 seconds, unless you're troubleshooting something specific. Yay, someone likes it. <laughs> yes. Yes. You, you have the ability to cluster it. It does have that. You can, you can actually run it in their cloud as well and pay for it and get support. So you don't necessarily have to run it as open source without support. So there's, there's ways to do it where it's not totally like free and without support. Telegraph is probably the only thing that technically doesn't have support, but they do have, InfluxDB does have a very active Slack channel that gives you help with Telegraph. So, and Grafana has a paid for version as well if you need, need you know, if you need support around that. So you can, technically you can pay for all this stuff as well, as well as set it up for free. So, it's kind of, you know, Pick your poison, which way you need to have it. Yes? No, it's for all metrics. For, for each, each service that you set up, every time you set up Telegraph, for that service, you're defining a met, you, you define the polling period. So if you set up the service on a different server, you could say 30 seconds over here, 10 seconds over there. But it's for every metric. Yes. The, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the first part on. Uh, um. Well, for the dashboards themselves, they can just be exported as JSON and stored in GitHub. And then you can just re-import them. Um, 
I'm sure there's a database behind Grafana that could be backed up that keeps the config so you can keep your alerts and stuff like that as well. I'm just not aware of it. Yeah, there's, there's something. I'm just not aware of what exactly it is. Yes? We really didn't see much of anything. Uh, we, we threw it on servers that were 80, 90% pegged and didn't really notice. Oh, still all the time. Yeah. We, re, we, re, we really rewrote the queries into version 2 because version 1 was pretty heavy. So, yes? Well, uh, in the slide I go over at the end, we, we run it on a one gig machine with hardly any disk space. <laughs> I'm running it on CentOS on my machine, but you can run it on Ubuntu. I'm not sure what, it just, it installs what it needs as far as the web goes. It doesn't, you don't have to install a um, web server for it. Yeah. You just install the software by itself. You get the OS up and running, you just install Grafana and it's done. You don't have to install anything with it. You just need the OS and Grafana. And the port opened and the service started. That's a simple and that's the way Influx is as well. Any other questions at the moment? Let's see, we'll go back into the slides just in case we don't have time. And we'll come back and look at more dashboards if we have time or take more questions. So some resources that actually collect some queries because, like I said, this solution does not collect queries or, the, or I think it's too heavy to use the solution that does collect queries every 10 to 30 seconds. And I think you want to get your me metrics every 10 to 30 seconds and not every minute and five minutes or whatever. So you can use SPU as active on a system that's not too terribly busy as far as transaction count and dump it into a table like every minute and set up a job to clean it up. This is what I did at a, at a bunch of companies. It's probably still running at a few of them. <laughs> so that's one way to get your data, and it'll capture your execution plans, which are estimated plans out of your cache for you, so you, you, you can get an idea of what that's doing. We also, of course, have Query Store, which I wrote the book on. <laughs> so if you're running 2016 or above, you can actually use that to capture it, and it actually aggregates your data over time, so it gives you a better picture of what's going on, so you can see, hey, this store procedure has run 100 times in the last hour, and it's taking up the most CPU or the most reads, and I need to troubleshoot that one instead of just seeing individual execution counts and SPU is active. So that gives you some, some useful things that you can use for that, and it's useful for some other things as well, a query story is. So. I can go over those after the session if anybody wants to know anything else about Query Store. So, as far as actually solving a problem with this, I got I got woke up one time from my nap on a Saturday, <laughs> and I got this dumb page that I didn't know what it meant that was set up by somebody that didn't tell us that he was setting up this page, and it just said critical socket timeout after 10 seconds. To this day, I still don't know what that means. All I really know is what it means is what the chart means after the fact. So I checked the server, right? And the server was up and fine, you know? It looked fine. I, for 10 minutes, I looked at it, and everything looked, you know, hunky-dory. So I just went back to sleep. It's like, you know, whatever. But then I, I got up later and I was really curious as to why I got woke up, you know, I was kind of still mad about it because I didn't know what that page meant. Why do I have a page that I never heard of? So I looked at my buffer pool and it dropped by 44 gigs. That's a lot. And my PLE we went down from 19 hours to zero milliseconds. So I guess it, for like 10 seconds it was down at, at zero milliseconds and it decided that was a socket timeout of some sort. So then I used my SP who is active to find out CheckDB was running, and then I was really mad. I was like, I don't really care if CheckDB is running. Why wake me up for that? And of course, I had an on-call selfie, too. <laughs> Sorry, I suffer from migraines, so I, I have to do the headphones and the sunglasses during the day to, to sleep. So that's my on-call selfie as I went back to sleep prior to actually investigating it. 
So it kind of makes it fun. So as far as the cost goes and sizing of systems, I've, I've, we've talked questions around this a little bit. So we were running this in AWS at, at a fairly large company where we had 500 servers. So this is where I'm going to speak about the cost and the size. So we had InfluxDB for about 3,000 3, bucks a year for 500 servers on a T4 macro in AWS. And that whatever specs that is now may have changed because that's a couple years ago. So it had eight CPUs and 32 gigs of RAM and 600 gigs of disk space. And it had about six months worth of data in there. And we were starting to look at downsampling in it at that point in time. And I don't work there anymore, so I don't know what we did with it. So, <laughs> so if you start running slower, you might need more space. You might need more memory. I don't know. But this is we got this far in six months with this cost. So for 1500 bucks, we got this far. As far as Grafana goes, we stuck it on a box with one CPU and one gig of memory. We don't care about the space. Give it 10 gigs, that's probably plenty. Um, so for five bucks a month, we had Grafana up and running on a box. You probably can run them on the same server and not have any issues. But we wanted them separated out because everybody wants applications on separate servers and things like that. So that's what we did. So. I come to the end, unfortunately. So I can go back and show more charts and take questions, but um, for everybody that's leaving, um, fill out session evals, please, because you can win something. I don't remember what, but there's a prize in it for you. Yes, question. Yes. Yes, and I can actually show you some of the data sources. Yes. Yes, you can, because you can you can you can store it in SQL Server, and you can use SQL Server as a source, and then you you can use a table um, plugin, and just query the data. So, Test. Like I said, storing the data in there and trying to get it time series at the same time with SQL Server is a little tricky. It's basically what that adds up to. But if we um, go to data sources and I try to add a data source, we get this nice long list of data sources. And there's more that you can actually add. We got Prometheus, Graphite, stuff I never heard of, Elasticsearch, MySQL, PostgreSQL, SQL Server, CloudWatch to AWS to pull their monitoring data down, Azure Monitor, Grafana Cloud, and you can find more on their website. So, and then there is a list of the plugins that um, Telegraph supports here. There's a very long list of plugins that they got AWS CloudWatch, the Azure Storage Queue. I'm just pointing out things I actually know, Cassandra, Cisco stuff, Couchbase. Docker, Elasticsearch, GitHub. InfluxDB, of course, because it's got to monitor itself, IP tables, Jenkins, Kafka, Kubernetes, Linux, Log Parser, Log Stash, a bunch, 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 a bunch of stuff. And they keep adding stuff because it's open source. So they've got, you know, multiple people working on it. 
And I do have a blog series that goes through exactly how to set this up with all the commands and with the links that will take you back to the website. If you're not using CentOS or you need the newest version, you can click on the link to go to their website and get the newest version because the blog's, you know, of course, a little bit old now and you're not getting the newest version. So you can walk right down the steps of doing it once you get the OS installed. that will take you right through doing it for a SQL Server and has the scripts and everything to, to do it. It'll take you through setting up the InfluxDB monitoring as well, setting it up to monitor SQL and Linux, monitoring a Windows box as well. So, and I'm sure there's plenty of people that have blogged about monitoring all the other things that Telegraph will monitor. And then Microsoft has their Azure SQL DB blog that they published in at the very end of September for Azure SQL DB. And they're using Docker for it as an example of how to run it. So they've got their dashboards for Azure SQL DB sitting out here and how to set it up using Docker. So that's another option instead of setting up servers. And they've got scripts for that sitting on GitHub. And they got their example of how to do it when they did managed instances, which I think they used servers when they did that. So, But all those links are in the slide deck so that you can find them and, and get to them and know how to set it up. So. Any more questions? I've silenced the room. Not yet. That's a good thing. Yeah, because well, it's by default, when it stores the data in there, it's creating the tables, but it's not creating indexes or anything. And as he mentioned, it's not in the right time format because it's by default UTC time in, in the time series database. So then when it's querying it, it has to convert it. So you would have to stick another column in there that automatically updates when it inserts the data and it queries by that column instead of the original column. And you have to create the indexes for like instance name for the host, for like, you know, the server name and, and then for the object name for the metric and stuff like that to get it operational in SQL Server. Whereas the time series database already takes care of that with their there are special things like their field tags and their, their uh, tag keys. And the fact that it's a time series database, it's already got all that built in because it was built for, tele, you know, Telegraph was built around InfluxDB. And technically, you probably could write your SP who is active data straight to InfluxDB using PowerShell. You could. I'm not sure I'd recommend it. I'd have to try it first. You could probably do it using PowerShell. I've, I've used PowerShell to write other data to in, InfluxDB, so I'm just not sure how, how it would work out with SP who is active because there's a number of text columns. That would be my concern is the number of text columns in the XML and stuff. I'd, I'd have to fine tune it to which columns it actually returns because it returns so much data. Well, it does have a. Well, it does have a plugin that's just a table, so you can just. Yeah. 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 It's not really designed for it as, as well, so that's why it's probably best to keep it in SQL Server and do some. You have to do some magic around it to get it to get it displayed. Yeah. So any more questions? No? All right. So fill out your nice session eval so you can win a prize. Prizes are nice, right? Thank you all for coming. Hope you have a good afternoon.